Will you guys pray with me, Lord? May the words of my mouth, the meditation of our hearts be acceptable in your eyes, O Lord, our God and Savior, the author and perfecter of our faith. Amen. Congregation may be seated. So today, we, like I said, we are beginning this new series on the uh, book of Psalms. We're going to be making our way from the be beginning to the end. Today, actually, we're going to start at the end and make our way back to the beginning. Um, and if you would like, there are these notebooks still back there. If we run out, please let me know, and I will gladly go buy some more that will be here by next Sunday. So the book of Psalms is this amazing uh, tool. In fact, it's probably an almost uh, daunting tool uh, to use, uh, this book of poetry, uh, where the authors are speaking in ways that we are not quite used to, about God, and about life, and stress, about pain, and suffering, and about hope, and all sorts of different imageries going on throughout it. And throughout different points in my life, I have tried to use the book of Psalms as a prayer book for my life. Um, and I have found uh, throughout different chapters, it works really well sometimes, and other times it struggles. My bookshelf, one of the bookshelves in my office is full of uh, half-attempted books, uh, where I, or half-read books, where I've attempted to use those for personal devotion. But this model, this notebook model, is one that I've really enjoyed. And so I hope it's a useful tool for you. Like I said, over the next few weeks, we are going to be looking at different ways to engage these psalms, and hopefully they are beneficial for you. Um, there will be blog posts going up uh, that sort of reinforce uh, what we've been talking about here, uh, if you would like to check those out later. So what is the book of psalms? The book of Psalms is 150 different poems and prayers. And if you begin to look at it, um, it can become uh, overwhelming, the amount of content that is in there. And the book of Psalms has always been a book that has been uh, revered and respected amongst the Christian community. Um, if, you, if you were ever given like a, a gospel Bible, right, it's just the four gospels, it's also almost always going to include the book of Psalms. They'll get rid of the rest of the Old Testament, but the book of Psalms is one that they're always willing to keep with it. And we'll get into why about that in a little bit. The book of Psalms is written by uh, seven different known authors. So King David being the most prominent one of those. But there are also 49 Psalms that are anonymous, and we have no uh, understanding or idea of who wrote those. And this is a, a key point for us to understand here. The book of Psalms it was intentionally arranged after the return from exile. So at the uh, end of our, the Old Testament, as God's people come back to Jerusalem, as they begin to build the second temple, uh, the scribes and leaders of God's people uh, began to arrange these Psalms into, um, into this flow that helps us with our laments and our praises to God. They're coming to God with our griefs and sufferings about what we see in this world, uh, but also songs of praise and hope that we have in Jesus Christ. And they intentionally put it in some sort of order. And you begin to see this actually if you turn to the very end first. So if you have your book, open up to 146 to 150. And you'll notice, if you look at 146 to 150, how does every one of those uh, psalms begin and end? Hallelujah, right? Uh, it begins with this word, hallelujah, which is two words that are combined together. Hallelu, meaning praise, and Yah, begin, uh, which is the beginning of God's name, Yahweh. So hallelujah, meaning praise Yahweh or praise to God. And so those five psalms at the end of the book here begin and end with this idea of praising God. Now, if you flip back to the very beginning of your book, if you go all the way to the very beginning, Psalm 1, you'll notice up there that it says book 1. And then it tells you uh, that that is going to contain Psalm 1 through uh, Psalm 41, right? And... I'm going to challenge this for a second just because I like to. 
Book one is written all by Psalm David, except for the first two. So we're going to take the first two out, and we're going to say that it's book uh, Psalm 3 through 145 are what's split into five books. And here's why. I'll get into it in a second. So there are five books there. Um, all of the Psalms are broken down into these five books. And what you'll notice, so turn to Psalm 41. I promise we will slow down on the page turning in a second. Turn to Psalm 41 and look at how it concludes. It concludes with, blessed be the Lord, the God of Israel, from everlasting to everlasting, amen. Now, bear with me for a second and turn to Psalm 72, which is the end of book two. This is King Solomon writing this one. And this uh, the very second to last verse, 19. Blessed be his glorious name forever. The whole earth is filled with his glory. Amen and amen. And then it even says, the prayers of David, son of Jesse, are concluded. All right, it's, it's just a helpful little note. And each of the books are going to end with a very similar pattern, these five books that are there. Blessed be the Lord, the God of Israel, from everlasting to everlasting. Amen and amen. And so we're going to separate Psalm 1 and 2 out from the rest of it, again, because book 1 is written by King David, um, or most of them are by King David, except for Psalm 1 and 2. And so we're going to dive into why, uh, why that is. And the why, and I'll just give it now, right? So if Psalm 146 to 150 are a conclusion, and then Psalm 3 to 145 are the main body, it would make sense that there's an introduction also. So let's look at this introduction first. So if you want to turn back to Psalm 1. Psalm 1 can be summarized into uh, one particular phrase. Blessed is the one who meditates on the Torah. The Torah being the law of God. The Torah being uh, the first five books, the Pentateuch, those first five books of the Bible. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. Those are the most important books throughout the Old Testament. Yes, even more important than the book of Psalm. And they help us to understand what God is doing in this world, his plan of rescue and salvation for his people, and the way he is working through his people. And what we read, especially uh, in uh, Deuteronomy, is how God's people are constantly being reminded to study his word to meditate on his word, to repeat it to their children, to talk about it. Man, did we just do a sermon series where we talked about doing that? Um, we did. Um, and so Psalm 1 kicks off with this idea of one being blessed when he studies God's word. How happy is the one this translation starts with? Other translations would say how blessed or blessed is the one. We are happy when we meditate on God's word. And notice, there are so many beautiful things that are going on in this psalm. And if I, we really wanted to tear into them, we would be here for a very long time. So I will save us from doing that. But notice uh, some of the language that it's using there. How happy is the one who does not walk, stand, or sit, right? So there's this idea of traveling towards and down into where sinners are gathered. Instead, he is like a tree planted by flowing streams. And then go down uh, to verse 4 and 5. The wicked can't even walk. They're being blown around like shafts of, in the wind. And they can't even stand up in the judgment areas or in the assembly of the righteous. Psalms is being portrayed here then as this new type of uh, teaching for God's people, this lifelong practice of prayer as God's people are, are striving to meditate and obey his commands. He is like a tree planted by flowing streams that bears its fruit in season. Its leaf does not wither. Whatever he does prospers. Like a tree planted by flowing streams. God's people are to plant themselves next to his word, to meditate upon it day and night, and to receive from God all of their blessings and life. Blessed is the one who meditates on God's word. Psalm 2 then 
did you notice it sort of changes tone very quickly? You get this sort of beautiful image in Psalm 1 about uh, flowing streams and trees and all of that stuff. And then Psalm 2, it's like, why do nations rage and the people plot in vain? Now I'm going to destroy everybody who's trying to plot against me. It sounds rather uh, chaotic and messy. But what's actually happening here is if you had a complete Bible and not just this blue one that I gave you, right? You'd be able to turn to uh, 2 Samuel uh, chapter 7 which is this uh, covenant that God is making with the people David. David had uh, finally rested from all his wars and God uh, was still just living in the Ark of the Covenant while David had this big uh, castle, this big uh, throne room, and he wanted to build God a temple, a better place for God to be living. And God comes to him and says, no, you're not going to do that. Instead, I'm going to make something great out of you. Out of you is going to come God's salvation for uh, all of his people. And so Psalm 2 is this poetic reflection on that covenant that God made with David. And it's reminding us that all who take refuge in the messianic king are happy. All who find their refuge in what Jesus is going to do, in what God is going to do through Jesus, are going to be happy and blessed. Those who try to take refuge elsewhere, amongst other nations, amongst other uh, empires and rulers within the world, they're going to be destroyed. And you won't be so happy. And so what we see if we sort of put Psalm 1 and 2 together, as most people would like to do, we see this prayer book of God's people who are striving to be faithful to God's word while they wait for the messianic kingdom, while they wait for Jesus to come into the world. This is a book then arranged so that while we wait, while we deal with the troubles of the world and the chaos that is all around us, we can meditate on God's word. We can wait for him full of hope. And so it might be easy to say, well, the Psalms have nothing to do with us. We... We live in a perfect world, right? Uh, We're not waiting for Jesus to come back. Well, wait, no, we are. Um, We're not uh, dealing with troubles and chaos in this world. No, that most of us actually are, right? The book of Psalms can apply to our lives also in the sense that we experience pain and trouble and suffering in this world. We look out and we see the chaos that is going on all around us. And sometimes we just want to cry out to God, how much longer? Are you going to return like you promised? How much longer do we need to take refuge and wait in you? And so in the book of Psalms, we are going to encounter hope. Hope in the midst of suffering, hope in the midst of pain, hope in the midst of all that is wrong, but hope that is looking forward to the return of our king. And so in the book of Psalms, we are going to encounter three different groups. God's law, the Torah, and the Messiah, the anointed one, the king who is going to come and make all things new again. We're going to encounter lament, which is more than just whining and crying about the world. But it's an observation that this is not how it's supposed to be. Coming to God with that saying, God, please make it right again. But also balanced with praise and thanksgiving for all of the blessings that God has given to us. And we're going to encounter messages of faith, trust in what God has done, and hope. That uh, that forward-looking trust that we have that God is going to come back again. But diving into this book, all 150 chapters of it can be very daunting. It can be difficult to know even where to begin. Do you just open Psalm 1 and just start reading it? Some people do. I've tried doing it. That's not the most helpful way for me to do it, but for some people it works. Other people like to uh, just sort of, uh, there are reading plans out there that tell you what Psalms to read. I have, I've picked up like 20 books for this series and I'm Really grateful to dig into all of them, but there's one. It's about Psalms in 30 days. I um, mean, you're reading morning, noon, and night, and eventually you'll make it way through all 150 of them. Today, I want you to. I want to introduce a different way of 
uh, experiencing and interacting with the Psalms. Because often we just read them and move on. And at the bare minimum, that is great. Because God is working even in that reading. Even in that encounter with his word. But what I want to challenge us is to try and go a little bit deeper. To try something a little bit more. And each week we're going to introduce different tools to help us do that. This first one that we're going to introduce today is called Lectio Divina. And... Some of us might have experience with that. Some of us might have thoughts about it. I promise it's a decent tool and it works well. But Lectio Divina is uh, Latin for divine word, for this uh, divine reading of God's word. It's where God encounters us with his external word. And it's broken down into sort of three steps. Step one, you meditate on a specific set of scripture verses praying along the way. You listen and look for a certain word or phrase that stands out to you. And then you spend time in silence reflecting on God's word. And then you reread the scripture and consider the implications of God, the word of God or phrase that you picked out for yourself. Is it a word of comfort or a word of challenge? What is God telling you by this? And then step three, you reread it again, and you resolve to repent, asking yourself, what is God inviting you to change in your thinking or doing? And asking yourself, how might you turn and come closer to him based on what God is telling you today? And so we are going to try something today. And who knows, by next week, I might say we're never doing this again. But I think it will work. We're going to take five minutes right now. And five minutes might seem like a very long time. And it's not. I promise you it's not. We're going to take five minutes. And we're going to go through this model by yourself as you want, reading Psalm 1 or Psalm 2. Read it. Meditate on it. Look for certain words or phrases that stand out to you and then spend time in silence and then reread it again. And consider the implications or phrases uh, or God's words uh, for you, and then read it again for the third time. Include that time with prayer. Larry is going to come up because five minutes of silence can be very awkward for some of us, and so he's going to play some music to help us uh, help break up some of that awkwardness as we try and meditate now on God's word. And so I invite you to uh, take these next few minutes and look at Psalm 1 or 2.
And so what I want to invite and encourage you to do is if this is something that uh, you find useful, take it home and try it this week. Like I said, there will be uh, more information going up uh, on our social media and emails about uh, how to engage with this tool. If five minutes is too long for you, that's okay. Cut it down to three minutes. There is no set rule on doing this. If you want to try and do it every day this week, by all means. And if you skip a day, forgive yourself and move on to the next day, right? Engaging with God's word is not some perfect thing where we have to have it all right to be able to do it, where everything has to be lined up and perfect. And if we don't somehow do it that way, then God isn't going to hear us or accept our prayers. Spending time in God's word is a lifelong experience that we journey through. And so may the book of Psalms be a tool then that is useful for this. And so may God who gives to us the book of Psalms continue to hear us as we come to him with our prayers of lament and praise. And may we all continue to grow together in Christ. In his name we pray, amen.